Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to another Eurocontrol Aviation Straight Talk Live. Delighted you can be with us. Thanks for coming along. My name's Andrew Charlton, and today I'm delighted to say that I'm talking to Mr. Tony Douglas, the CEO of Etihad Airways. Uh, I should note that I do some work for Etihad Airways, so in the interest of full disclosure, I make that point. But I know that Tony has some really broad ranging views and some really sensible views on a number of topics, and I'm really looking forward to talking to him today. But as ever on Straight Talk, before we do that, I'd like to ask the DG of Eurocontrol, Mr. Eamon Brennan, if he'd be so kind as to fill us in with what the market is doing at the moment and how the situation is looking. Eamon, if you'd be so kind. Good afternoon and welcome to another Aviation Straight Talk live from Eurocontrol here in Brussels. Today's guests, Tony Douglas, the CEO of Etihad Airlines and Andrew Charlton. Really looking forward to a good debate on Abu Dhabi, setting it as a hub, the growth of Etihad, the prospects of the Middle East and of course the various aircraft type that they will be using. So I hope that uh, you enjoy it. But before we go on that to that today, let's have a look at how the network has been performing and what the key events in aviation have been over the last week. First of all, as everybody's talking about today, the Reiner diversion um, in Belarus to Minsk. As you can imagine, this was very, very topical over the last um, number of days and it got serious consideration internationally, but particularly by the European Council. So the result of this is many airlines will not be flying European ones through Belarusian airspace in the coming months and Belarusian airspace will not be flying in European airspace and to European airports. And in the network manager, we will, of course, facilitate this. So that's a big political fallout from this incident in quite a short time. So moving on, I've got some good news for you. And the good news is for the last seven days, we've seen an improvement of about 27%. Now, let's not get too excited. It's from a very, very low base, but we've reached 45% of 2019 figures, which is better than the performance at Christmas or at Easter. And that's a good thing. So I'm very keen to give you some good news for once. Also worth looking at what happens when you lift restrictions. When you lift restrictions and quarantines, you can see here in Greece, straight away, we had a huge increase in capacity. And this was put on by the airlines. And this also happened in Portugal. So if you look at the Portuguese figures, once the quarantine between the UK and Greece was lifted and the restrictions, you got a major, major upsurge. And that's really good. This is really shows the need, though, for the EU digital COVID certificate. The big news here this week is they've changed its name. It's not now called a green cert, it's the digital COVID certificate. And basically, it should be rolled out in all states by the 1st of July. And we're encouraging everybody to use this and we anticipate it will be included in airline apps as well and all, all kinds of things. Now, how have the airlines done? It's been a difficult week. Look at uh, the 25th of May. Largest airline in Europe, Turkish Airlines, driven mainly by domestic operations. But return of Ryanair, return of EasyJet to the top 10. And this is brought about by the travel to Portugal and the travel to Greece. And we expect to see Spain, Malta, others open up in the next number of weeks. And we're really looking forward to this. On a worldwide basis... What's worth looking at, of course, is that Europe is still the worst affected region in the world for performance. Middle East down minus 44%. The United States, a little bit of improvement to 29% reduction. And China, plus 6 And, you know, we don't expect long-haul operations to the Asia-Pacific to resume realistically until um, November and to Australia it may be in the new year. So we do expect to see the North Atlantic getting going UK to USA uh, perhaps in middle second half of June, late June and then from the rest of Europe um, in July. So we're optimistic about the North Atlantic, reasonably optimistic about uh, June, July and August in the European um, holiday network and then let's see how things evolve. Hopefully as vaccines roll out things will improve. Last week, we issued our forecast for the next four or five years, right up to the um, end of 2024. Really nothing different than what we said before. The forecasts have been generally very accurate within about 1%. What we're saying and the essential message is, we don't expect aviation to recover to the 2019 levels until the end 
of 2024, quarter one, 2025. So what we're seeing basically is about 50% in the network of the overall traffic uh, based on 2019 figures for this year. And uh, we think we'll get a reasonable good acceleration and return to growth to next year. Really, it depends on the vaccines. And this is dependent on all over the world, Africa, China, you know, Asia Pacific, really important. Now, let's have a look at today. Today, we host Etihad, really significant carrier um, based in Abu Dhabi. You know, 17.5 million passengers in 2019, a huge drop to 4.2, 4.3 million passengers in 2020. Like others, like Air France, like KLM, like British Airways, sustained by cargo, up 66%. And of course, um, they expect to return to profitability by 2023. And of course, you have got this super initiative with the 787 Greenliner testbed, which is going really well. So I hope you enjoy everything today with um, Tony and Andrew. I'm really looking forward to it. But just before I go, I want to mention that we have coming up before the summer, uh, Luis Philippe de Oliveira and, of course, uh, John Slattery from uh, GE. And both these will be really excellent. Uh, Luis will give us an outline of Airports Council International worldwide, and John will look at it from a manufacturer's point of view. So enjoy everything today. Thank you. Tony, welcome to Straight Talk. Thanks very much for your time. Glad you could be here. Andrew, thanks to you, sir, and uh, good day to everybody. So um, it's been a fairly difficult 18 months or so. How's it, how's it going for Etihad? Well, I think everybody's fully aware that this has been the most difficult challenge that commercial aviation has ever been through. And uh, it's been difficult for everybody, obviously Etihad included. And I think uh, we're starting to get used to the ambiguity of this because almost every day, the situation changes as a result of travel restrictions, easing in some places, becoming more restrictive in others. But we remain optimistic because, of course, there is a huge pent up demand for us all to get back to the joy of normal traveling, to see our family, our loved ones, to enjoy leisure and, of course, the social interaction in a business environment that uh, we all miss as well. So. I guess there's an optimism that underlies the current situation, but uh, the balance with all of that is there's every chance that this will continue for the foreseeable future. Indeed. Could we have a quick word, if I may, about the travel restrictions you referred to? Were you disappointed that the UAE was not allowed entry into the United Kingdom, was, was kept on the red list, even though India wasn't for a very long time? Look, I think the travel restrictions that have been put in place all around the world have been in the main for good reason. It's an attempt to, of course, slow uh, the transmission of this pandemic. And, you know, I think it's fair to conclude some countries have been faster than others in the way in which their policy has been set out uh, in that regard. Um, this week, within Abu Dhabi. We're absolutely delighted that on the green list that allows people to come into Abu Dhabi without uh, restriction, the United States of America has been added to our green list. Germany has been added to our green list. Spain has been added to our uh, green list, as well as Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan, and also Moldova. The UK was already on our green list. Uh, if you are traveling uh, from that incredible country to this incredible country. So I guess in one sense, yes, on a personal level, I'm somewhat disappointed that there is still a travel restriction for us here in the United Arab Emirates going back to the UK, given the fact that we're of the highest vaccination uh, per capita in the world. This has been particularly well managed, in my opinion, here in the United Arab Emirates. And I just hope that on one of the forthcoming uh, revisions of the green list, that the UAE will be added to where I believe it rightly belongs. So do you see the future as <clears throat> traffic lights or colour coding or whatever for the foreseeable future? Or do you think the vaccinations will eventually get us there? 
So I think it's a key question, um, Andrew, in terms of, you know, we study, like I imagine many others, the correlation between vaccine administration curves by country and the corresponding reduction when it comes to COVID positive test curves and, of course, fatality curves. And I think it's categorically proven up to now there is not a flaw in the vaccination strategy per se. And as a consequence, I think it's fair to conclude that if many of the countries maintain the trajectory that they're on with administering vaccines at the moment, if we look three to six months into the future, we ought to assume that there will be a significant improvement in regard to the risk to public wellness. And therefore, logic would suggest that will see green lists, as we describe it today, being significantly increased. But with that in mind, it's certainly our opinion, and I know, again, with many others within the industry, that a form of electronic travel pass will ease the way in which our wellness status will be attested. Um, you know, we, like a number of others, have been trialling the IATA travel pass. We've been uh, trialling that on all of our North American uh, services out of Abu Dhabi. But importantly, Etihad was the first and frankly the only airline still all the way back since August of last year to 100% PCR test all guests at point of origin, no matter where it was in the network. And of course, here on destination, and obviously back to the network, if it's at point of origin, it gives assurance for the transfer uh, passenger. We're the only airline to do it, we still do. And that's given us a huge body of data from which to be able to analyse what the risk on normal commercial travel is. And not surprisingly, I think it's a rather strange analogy to use, but nonetheless, looking at the numbers, here I am in the United Arab Emirates, it's probably 44 degrees outside. Statistically, I think I've got more chance of being struck by lightning three times in the run than I have of catching COVID-19 on an Etihad flight. And the reason for that is there's hard controls 72 hours before you board. We have a dedicated wellness product on board. We were the first airline in the world to have 100% vaccine cabin crew and flight crew. We've eliminated all unnecessary touch points on board. And we've done a cabin refresh where not only have we lifted the presentational standard of our very young um, and uh, sophisticated fleet of 787 Dreamliners, but what we've also done, like many others, is sanitised them to operating theatre levels. So as a consequence, we can guarantee people's wellness on board. And back to an electronic form of visa, be that a IATA travel pass, be that a European green pass, we're very, very confident that that will become a new norm mm. and the sort of thing that will allow us the ease of passage to travel progressively as this pandemic moves to the next phase later this year. You mentioned there, Tony, that you've been collecting data and you've been collecting that data since August of last year. What I don't see around the industry, though, is that sort of data being made available and analysis being made to help push forward the argument that that we, we know a lot more about this than at the moment everyone seems to think we do when we've got all this data. Why, why is the industry not using the data that it has, do you think? Well, I think there's probably a number of components in the answer to that, Andrew. I think, first of all, as I've commented, because we're the only airline that have been doing it at point of origin, no matter where you are, um, it's linked to the PRN number uh, on the ticket. So you simply can't board an Etihad flight um, unless you've got an attested PCR and or uh, vaccine uh, approval. Um, because many other airlines don't have any form of tracking currently in that regard, I think the body of data is probably simply unavailable. Mm, uh, okay. But what does it tell us? 
it tells us that 99.52% of everybody that's travelled with Etihad since last August has done so COVID-free. Um, it tells us categorically if we reverse out um, what was the uh, profile of countries that contributed to where we saw spikes, which was predominantly the Indian subcontinent last year and some of the Levant countries, you got to 0.015% of people who were testing positive between point of origin and point of arrival. Hence the comment before, statistically, it is way and above the average of any of the countries that are currently publishing the national statistics. Mm. And the reason why I confidently go out there and say, in a well-managed environment, the ability for us all to be welcomed back to the joy of travel with uh, commercial airlines, if it's contained within a digitized form of reference of one's PCR and or vaccine status, that will almost certainly be the next stage of the rocket, so to speak, when it comes to moving us on from the challenges that we've seen over the last 16 months. So where do you think the industry will be five, 10 years from now? How do you think it will look? Will it look like it did in 2019? Another really good question, Andrew. Um, I guess uh, we've all been looking at forecasts. I remember back to last March 2020, when we regrettably had to temporarily ground our fleet. Mm. And at that stage, the consensus was probably from late 2022. Most of them, uh, the median was in 2023. And there was one or two outliers into Q1 of 2024. Um, and I'm referring to both, um, you know, key analysts, airlines and, you know, professional followers of our industry. That was the kind of, you know, range of recovery back to 2019 passenger numbers. I think where we are today, it's almost moved on a linear basis, probably to the right. Um, with equal, uh, you know, time impact. So if I was responding to this today, stressing the fact all other things remain in equal, we would probably take a sense of late 2023 into 2024 to return back to 2019 numbers. But of course, our crystal ball is no better calibrated than anybody else's. Well, indeed. But in the future is no better therefore. And of course, who knows whether there'll be follow on ways, but all other things remain in equal. We're pretty optimistic that that latent demand from all of us to get back to normality, will probably see it in that range. But structurally, do you think the industry will be the same or, or will the, the stresses that we've had in the last 18 months force some sort of change? I mean, you, have a fleet of A380s, I suspect. Do you think they'll fly again, by way of example? Do you see mergers in the industry, things like that? So I think, you know, if one looks far enough ahead, um, there is a clear correlation between global population, GDP growth and disposable income and a desire for commercial air travel. So there are many forecasts still out there that suggest over the course of the next 20 years, it could well double again, all things remaining equal. We're in quite a unique geographical location here in the UAE because we're six flying hours from 80% of the world's population. Um, and a number of those geographies are amongst the fastest growing in terms of demand in regard to, again, Indian subcontinents, um, obviously, uh, the Chinese market and the African uh, market. So there is an underlying confidence that the growth and the demand from those markets will still uh, require uh, to be serviced. But to your point, we've already seen uh, a long list of airlines that sadly have gone into administration or voluntary administration during this pandemic. 
And I think it's realistic to assume that that list uh, may get longer before we come out of the other side. Again, um, I'm certainly no university professor, but I'm sure many academics would look at things that stimulate a seismic change to any market normally has the corresponding impact of all the things that you've mentioned in terms of some structural change slash reform, policy, government interventions, uh, mergers, um, reinventions of certain uh, products and services. And I think there's probably going to be a blend of a number of those. However, I guess I come back first and foremost to the fundamentals. The demand from everything we see longer term is still very much there. And whilst if you go back over the 30 years, for example, that I've been involved in aviation, you know, like many people uh, who are on this uh, live stream, you know, you'll see that, you know, the TWAs, the Pan Ams, you know, even the Freddie Lakers, so to speak, there's a long list um, of brands that no longer exist. Um, but nonetheless, you know, those aircraft are still out there quite often with different tail uh, logos upon them. And that's why I think what we'll see is a, you know, short term by definition, you know, one to three, possibly one to five year recalibration as a result of this, because it's created such a seismic impact on the balance sheets in particular of airlines. But there's no reason why we ought not to remain confident over the medium term. So let me um, try to put that in some other context then. I'm interested that you say we expect a lot of these things to grow back. Yes, there have been some. I don't think it's a, such a terribly long list of airlines, to be frank. But the weekend shenanigans in Belarus um, highlight again, don't they, the the national asp the national nature of aviation and the and the the fact that actually ICAO was powerless to do anything. Each state has to act. Do you think that we need structural change at that sort of level? It, it, it's obviously it's a complex question with a very specific example. Um, I, I guess I look at recent history and, um, you know, I, I, I see a kind of irony in what I'm just about to say. So, you know, from the 2017-18 uh, period, you know, there was quite an international challenge, for example, uh, in the context of open skies, uh, certainly from North America with this particular geography, and of course in Europe as well. Um, and, and here we are, uh, no more than four years later, uh, observing some of the biggest government interventions in the history of commercial aviation to quite rightly support um, national carriers, critical pieces of transport infrastructure, such that the public and the nations in question can make sure that they remain competitive going forward. So I don't criticise the kind of scalable and sizable bailouts for Lufthansa, Air France KLM, for Delta, for United, for American, but, you know, it's pot, kettle and black type of situation. Well, indeed. Are you well, hoping for, for a bit reason. less stick in the future or do you think that they will go back to bashing you up for state ownership? Look, I, I don't like to predict too far into the future because more often you'll get it wrong than right. So I don't think anything would surprise me or others in that regard. But I guess the point is this. Um, it's not happening purely for hypocritical reasons. It's happening because governments have decided that in the best interest of their economy and their nationals, their citizens, that the right thing to do is to be able to bail out in the short term a situation that will pass in order to maintain both connectivity and competitiveness for the medium term. And I think, you know, we should look at it perhaps in that light. But I go back to your question when you said, would we expect to see more nationalist intervention? I think we've already seen more in the last nine months than we've seen in the last decade in that mm -hmm. regard.
Yeah, oh, I think there's no question of that. Let's turn, th this is a challenge, there's no disputing it, <clears throat> the, the uh, coronavirus. But what about sustainability? Do you see that as a, a more existential threat than the pandemic? I've got a very blunt and simple answer to that, and it's yes. Good um, on. So like let's move on. To... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd rather if we don't move on and I'm allowed to unpack it, Andrew, because I think actually it's probably the biggest thing out there that is not a short-term adjustment. It's a medium to long-term reality that, in our opinion here at Etihad, there's likely to be more airlines in the fullness of time that will fail as a result of an inability to embrace the reality mm. of what we all have to do and how we collaborate to improve the longer term sustainability of commercial aviation. And with that in mind, I'd like to humbly think that Etihad is a thought leader in this space. We have two headline programs in particular. One is the Etihad Greenliner program, which is a separately branded aircraft. It's a flying test bed. It's a 787 Dreamliner. And we work in collaboration with obviously Boeing and General Electric, uh, but also many other organizations, big and small, to put all manner of different experiments into optimizing the performance of the aircraft and the reduction of its emissions. We've got a second aircraft, which is our Eco Demonstrator. It's also a 787 Dreamliner and with a number of different partners on that one, including NASA. And some of you might think that I've pronounced that slightly uh, incorrectly. So I'll go back and say it again. The North American Space Agency, NASA. That, that, famous, uh, that famous brand of shirt um, manufacturers, that must be the most branded shirt in the world, NASA. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And um, I think the incredible things they've done through the passage of history um, is the reason why that brand stands out the way it does. But I come back to um, that as an illustration. There's no copyright on bright ideas when it comes to sustainability. It might be people who are as globally acknowledged in innovation and technology as NASA, all the way through to small SMEs. Um, that can bring innovation. What we're trying to do is provide platforms for those innovations to be trialed upon. And therefore, if I come back to your question, uh, Andrew, I think increasingly aviation's biggest challenge will be for those airlines that have been able to step up and to put together those many small innovations, because there is no silver bullet for obvious reasons out there to preserve aviation going forward because it has got a sustainable platform to build off. And in the interest of time, I'll limit the examples I'm using because we've got a very long list of them. But on the green liner, we hold the world record for long range flying with 50% sustainable aviation fuels. We're big on working with a number of fuel companies in particular on hydrogen or e-fuels. We've done an awful lot on optimized flight planning um, in terms of continuous descents and the many other aspects of being able to reduce fuel burn and obviously then carbon emissions as a consequence. We've put a huge amount of effort into the elimination of single-use plastics, weight reduction in general, optimization of flight procedures and protocols, and the list goes on and on and on. But I guess the punchline is this. Going forward, we're probably going to see more pressure from governments and regulators that means that those who haven't been a thought leader in this space will probably end up penalising themselves. And I would argue, quite frankly, rightly so. So, 
you you are Etihad is well at the forefront in terms of SAF and and so forth. Do you think that aviation fuel should be taxed? So I think again, it's a it's a question that people understandably uh, pose on a regular basis, and I guess particularly now, I struggle with the concept of it because at the very moment when the industry requires bailing out, and my earlier comment, what so many governments are doing all around the world to do so, the idea of taxing at the very point when you're bailing out is quite frankly ridiculous in, in my opinion. And, you know, the old cliche, the analogy of the carrot and the stick, I'm a firm believer that rather than using the stick, i.e. tax, quite often to get everybody suitably motivated and incentivized to go on a long-term journey, a long-term commitment as important in this, one's better off in starting with the carrot. And the carrot for me is more in the space of incentives. And, you know, I observe with great interest, um, you know, even the incoming Biden administration has already introduced policy that will look to present incentivization for progressive use of SAFs, sustainable aviation fuels, to the point where it could impact anything between one and a half to two US dollars per US gallon for those people who get into the 50% overall emission reduction space. So I think back to timing, it's everything in business. Uh, some would argue it's everything in comedy as well, to put a lighter hearted uh, comment into play. But the timing for the stick is not at the point where the industry is reeling from the biggest challenge that it's ever had in its history. Now's the time for the carrot to incentivize, motivate and get people on that journey. And that's really the call out I would put to regulators and policy setters, because again, perhaps naively, but certainly humbly, it seems to us just to be common sense. So what about offsets? Do you think offsets are going to, therefore, do you think offsets are going to be an important part of the, the, the framework as we go forward? I think it's a component. Um, and I think it's a short term stepping stone. It's clearly not in its own right in any way a long term solution. So, for example, our green liner, uh, we've carbon offset it for the whole of 2021 by buying into a forestry uh, program in Tanzania. Um, and that's allowed us to offset this year around 70,000 tonnes of CO2. And therefore, we've used that as a short term means by which of contributing to our broader sustainability agenda. And in particular, through the Green Liner, which is the test bed uh, that I referred to earlier. It is, however, a stepping stone, as I described, because we're using that in order to give us a complementary and supporting sustainability uh, contribution, whilst the many other things that are the longer term solutions, be it again in hydrogen, e-fuels, improved technology and the many other things that uh, accumulate to improve performance give us a means to be able to sustain it within our own uh, control. And I think we're very lucky because we're dealing with 787 Dreamliner in particular. We've got one of the largest fleets in the world. And those, you know, aviation geeks amongst us would know the performance difference between a 787 um, just in its vanilla form compared to the previous generation of aircraft of similar size and scale. I'm an engineer by background. Um, you know, decades ago, if something was giving 2.1% performance improvement on a generation, it would probably deserve a lap of honour and three cheers. To give 21% improvement over a previous generation, 
And that's what 787 Dreamliner does, is a giant leap in the right direction, but it's nowhere close to the destination, hence the responsible acts of sustainability programs like the Greenliner and the Eco Demonstrator. And again, if I go back to my earlier comment that there's no copyright on bright ideas, it's really calling out to anybody out there who's got what they believe to be something that contributes the quote unquote genius idea, there's at least somewhere to take it to in order to experiment with it and bring it in combination with many other components that will contribute to us getting better at getting better. And I think that's the challenge that's out there for all of us. And the last comment perhaps on this as well, it's a fun challenge. This is one of those ones which, you know, it plays for those amongst us who love to squeeze out every last tiny drip of performance. And in the world of aviation, let's face it, that's what it's always been about. Yeah, well, indeed. <clears throat> you briefly mentioned hydrogen there, and I read with interest the other day that the UAE, perhaps even Abu Dhabi itself, is is launching a project uh, looking at hydrogen and, and its potentials. Do you see hydrogen as the future? Again, I think it's clearly one of the standout opportunities. Um, there are others, but hydrogen, I think, is the standout one. Uh, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, ADNOC, and also Mazda, which is the sustainable city here uh, in Abu Dhabi, are both putting a huge amount of investment into developing e-fuels in general. And obviously hydrogen is a key component within that. Uh, we're working in collaboration with them as Etihad, back to our sustainability programs that I referred to, but also with Shell uh, in this regard. Um, we see that obviously like SAFs in general, there is a prohibitive price point currently in place. Mm. Um, and therefore, what we have to do is to engage in a way that allows us to find opportunities to get the performance benefit first and foremost, from which things can be scaled up in a way where the price can then, inshallah, come down in an appropriate way. But it then gets me back to the carrot and stick. Um, you know, the idea then of certain uh, policy setters saying the T word, tax, um, is a solution, particularly at this time, is something I would openly challenge. Because if we're looking at more sustainable long-term solutions such as hydrogen uh, derivative fuels, it's all about how you get the bridge of incentive to get enough scale involved in it to then drive the competitive cost of it down. And I think that's the cycle that the e-fuel hydrogen uh, derivatives are currently in, and we're very excited by that, I have to say. Right. Um, <clears throat> moving on, although perhaps not much, you also mentioned that you're looking at um, optimised flight paths, um, continuous descent, etc. That throws us into uh, sort of back into the conversation about nationalism and ANSPs. And do you, how do you see the relationship between the airlines and the ANSPs? And, we, and, and we're struggling in Europe with trying to modernise and reform the system. Do you think that's a struggle worth the having? I think it's definitely a struggle worth to having, it was all to have. Um, and again, probably a, a poor analogy to use, but let's face it, many of the flight paths that are in place today are almost like Roman roads. Um, they were designed... No, they're not that straight, actually, the flight paths. <laughs> <laughs> they were designed an awful long uh, time ago uh, when what was travelling upon them was, by definition, completely different. You know, mm. the average range of aircraft um, when many of those flight patterns were originally designed, of course, is a fraction of what they're being deployed uh, for today. And, of course, the volume, for sure, was probably way beyond anybody's wildest dreams back in the day. So again, you know, the Roman ro uh, roads analogy, it's almost like country lanes, you know, in you know, many mature European countries, they're seldomly in straight lines because of land ownership related 
boundaries historically that meant that they've got lots of bends and curves and you will from point A to point B, if it was 100 kilometres, the road itself between A and B might have been 140 because it went left, it went right, it went up, it went down and so on and so forth. But the point is this, we have back to our eco demonstrator flights, operated a number of very controlled experiments into Dublin would be a standout case, um, Amsterdam would be a standout case and Brussels would be a standout case uh, where we've run these programs in the past. We have in coordination, obviously, with um, appropriate uh, control authorities, designed optimum flight paths. And in the process of so doing, we've been able to take 40 minutes out of what would have been the normal route, i.e. the windy country lane. And in particular, as a result of controlled descent, add the time saving and the controlled descent, we've taken up to seven tonnes of CO2 out. So I think it categorically proves the size of the prize. And if policy setters and regulators are serious about sustainability, are serious about reducing uh, the environmental effects of carbon, then this is probably one of the biggest opportunities that is in our grasp but requires so many of us to collaborate, to perhaps separate some of our other differences and to be able to find a smart solution to this one. So what about then, uh, I, I'm, I note with great interest that you, you've just, uh, I note with great interest that you were also the CEO of Heathrow for a while. How do you see the relationship then between that other end of the uh, of the ecosystem, the airports? The airports have really been struggling recently and, and think all this state aid has come into airlines, but there's been no trickle down. How do you see the future for airports? Well, as you rightly mentioned, you know, Andrew, we're all part um, of an end-to-end -end process. Um, you know, the travelling public, our guests, um, you know, um, experience the touch point from curb to curb, of which we, the airline, is a big part of that overall experience, but not exclusively the curb to curb, end to end part of it. Um, you know, efficient airports back to sustainability is really important. And there was always challenges in terms of many of the constraints uh, on movements at Heathrow that played into that. Um, and also back to air traffic control, as we referred to earlier. But of course, what we're talking about with airports is infrastructure assets, which are capital intense. And therefore, most of these businesses have sizable balance sheets. Quite often, sizable balance sheets require servicing, um, you know, because of the debt profile, perhaps. And as a result, it's not surprisingly to see, just like commercial airlines, so many of the airports now are under great stress. Um, and those assets, many of which in countries were historically government owned um, and then perhaps moved through privatisation processes, you know, many governments are stepping in to support them because they are nationally critical transport assets. And I think we would all accept there are almost no examples that any of us could think of, of a successful economy that hasn't got quality transport infrastructure. And uh, therefore, in the same way that we've observed government step in, as I've mentioned with airlines, I think supporting airports in some places is equally important. And so <clears throat> do you think we've, did, well, sorry, let me start that again. Obviously, Abu Dhabi is a, an amazing airport. You're just down the road from Dubai, another amazing airport. Do you do you see competition at an airport to airport level or is all the competition driven by you versus Emirates? So I think, first of all, in Abu Dhabi, we're very liberal when it comes to competition. Uh, you know, we welcome it. Um, you know, for example, some people may not be aware, uh, we have Wizzair Abu Dhabi operating uh, freely out of Abu Dhabi now. Um, again, I'm not in any way trying to be even mildly provocative about the hypocrisy of some of the open skies related historical challenges, but not many people I would imagine 
from a national standpoint, would want us as Etihad operating out of their country. But mm. I think back to the Wizard Abu Dhabi one, it's an illustration of an environment that welcomes competition. I also go back to the comment before that we're six flying hours to 80% of the world's population and the potential growth that comes from that as well uh, means that we believe that in this particular geography we're uniquely placed to play a very important part in that and the three airports here uh, operate uh, well certainly Abu Dhabi International Airport operates independent of the two major airports uh, World uh, uh, Trade uh, Al Maktoum Airport and DXB um, they compete against one another uh, in the same way that Etihad does with Emirates and I think that gives obviously the travelling public the guest um, the choice that they deserve and quite right too. Right well thank you Tony we're just about out of time but my last question is the question I always ask which is that what do you think a, a Euro control can do specifically to help European aviation but also global aviation? I think I acknowledge, and I know many others do as well, um, you guys do a great job. And you do a great job because you bring a thoughtful, well-informed and independent dialogue into play. And I think, you know, straight talk as an example would be something that, you know, we commend because it allows many different representatives from the industry to have their say and to allow hopefully generative conversations and dialogue to flow from it and you know all of these things in a small part contribute over time to opinion opinion quite often at some stage translates into policy setters uh, views and i go back in particular to sustainability i hope what you continue to do is allow that dialogue in a generative way to form its way through to policy setters, as already commented. But also in terms of the current pandemic, things like you know the freedom for us all to travel again will probably need some form of electronic visa travel pass format. And it will take a period of time to normalize the format of that. And I think, you know, conduits such as what you guys offer and the brilliance of the way in which you present the ability for this dialogue is really important. So it's a long winded way of saying, well done, guys. I think you're doing a great job. Well, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you think we are as well. And I certainly hope that you think that we've helped spark the conversation, helped spark the debate. I'd like to thank you again, Tony, for your time today. I, I'm sure that everyone found that as informative as I did. Uh, and I'd like to thank you very much and to remind you that the next couple of uh, straight talks that we have before the summer break coming up. We have uh, Felipe Dolavira from ACI, the uh, Airport Council International, and then we have Mr John Slattery from GE Aviation. So two very good and very important people to speak to. So it only remains for me to once more on your behalf thank Tony and to wish you all a very good day. <laughs>